Thank you all for that warm welcome. Thank you, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I got one. Thank you, Cheryl Pond here. I am the current president for the Filipino American Real Estate Professional Association of Silicon Valley. I'm also a real estate, a independent real estate broker for CBC Realty. Marina's mission is to elevate and promote the Filipino American real estate professional with the global community through, through education, uh, partnership, networking, and to, and to create a unified voice in the real estate industry. I'd like to introduce our board of directors and uh, officers. We have Anna Fron Lopez, who is the chair committee of this event. Annie Ramirez, she's also the chair committee for the Take Mission to the Philippines. Um, bless you. Dexter Latt is also our board of directors. Frank Ancia is also our board of directors. Divina Parvenu. Quinn, um, Tibran Batakis, those are our board of directors, Dory Tian Kusan, and our officers, our secretary, LJ Grossweiler, our treasurer, Mike Thailand, and our vice president, Robert Bellina. These are the directors that help and serve our community. Thank you all for your hard work, especially early morning. We love her, that's why we do it. And on behalf of Arriba Selena Valley and Evelyn Chua, we want to thank our sponsors, our panelists, for their support on our 30 dwelling unit, One Stop Workshop. Most especially our honored guest, the author of the Senate Bill 13 on ABU, Senator Bob Wykowski. I would also like to acknowledge and recognize Assembly Member Captain Chu for coming out to support our event and address some of the housing shortage issue. They'll be able to answer the majority of your question, what is ABU? What should you build an ATU? How to build one and to finance your project? Please give them a big hand of applause. And we would like to address the Sunday Cancer to please come out and uh, start. Thank you, CJ. Thank you. Thank you all oh, for your love. Oh, definitely, definitely. I'll introduce my lovely wife, Daisy Chu, also with us this morning. First of all, uh, Happy New Year. Jumong Namoy, or Gonghei Pachak. Today, this happened to be a New Year Day of our uh, lunar calendar. So, we were uh, celebrating uh, with the Throughout the night, yeah, uh, uh, last night, I'm very happy to be with you this morning. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Evelyn Chua and Ripa and definitely Senator Kalsi for joining us. Uh, uh, I worked with Senator Kalsi for many, many years. He's definitely a very, very camp, uh, champion for many of our causes in the state of California. And ADU was just one of them. We uh, there was a lot of uh, very good bills regarding to the, the bankruptcy, how do we uh, uh, give the people some relief, and, and so on and so forth. So it's really an honor to be with all of you and uh, introducing Senator Alpes, uh, Senator Wachowski to say a few words. All right, back to the MC, definitely. Thank you very much for taking your time here to uh, listen to this very important issue. We know the, uh, the crisis they were in, in Silicon Valley and beyond, uh, in terms of the, the homelessness and the affordable
affordable housing to you is definitely uh, one of the solutions that we'll be able to uh, apply to address this issue. And while we'll also thank vendors for coming uh, to join us and I picked up some uh, very, very valuable information and for sure. And I will back up to uh, get the work up. Thank you very much for uh, being here this morning. Thank you so much for to be here. All right, so let's get the program started, but we wouldn't be able to do this without a really uh, great person that is an advocate in Milkitas, and she works tirelessly for this event. Yeah. You know, I, you might not know her, but you, you, I'm sure you do. Um, please give a warm welcome to our community leader, Evelyn Chua, who's going to introduce our senator. Evelyn wanted to make sure that Milpitas understood and to know what is going on in this affordable housing, and I'm so glad she had us host this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I couldn't do it without these wonderful ladies. There are four of us, and we work really hard. We reach out thousands and thousands of people through social media, through the flyers, we walk Lopitas, we walk San Jose. We were all over. People that I didn't know said, oh, I saw your flyer at the library. I said, really? I didn't put some there, but they knew. We were also on Lopitas beat, and, and thank you. I first got involved with the ADU, seriously, when I was able to go to a, a homeless camp in San Jose, I got invited, and I saw how it, there's a dire need for affordable housing, and then fortunately, a few months later, I was given the honor of being a local hero through Senator Warkowski, and he started talking about the ADUs, and I said, oh my God, that is the father of ADU. I love you, Senator Warkowski. <laughs> so, so we tried to get his schedule, and we got today, even though it's Chinese New Year's, and I know they have to leave, but thank you, Senator, you're my hero. Thank you for being here. Senator Warkowski. Too many accolades. Um, thank you, Evelyn, and thank you for the work that you've done. And Ken Chu, thank you for your help up in the, the assembly. You know, we have two houses. We have the Senate and the assembly, so I can't do it on my own. And this is, SB 13 is what we'll get to and talk about. It's, you know, I've been representing Milpitas for 10 years now, either first in the assembly and now in the Senate, so it's nice to be with a hometown crowd and have the council member from Milpitas, Carmen Montano. Please, Carmen, stand up. She's, she's a candidate for the assembly seat. Kansan Chu's a candidate for her supervisor, so talk to them about those. Um, so let's. Right, right well, that's. that's I'll, I'll, I'm in the wrong county right now. That's, that's all right. So thank you, Filipino American Real Estate Professional Association, for inviting me. Thank you for the vendors and for everybody else that's here. I want to give, before I jump into SB 13, you know, this is the third ADU bill that I've done. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background because I didn't invent this. You know, the, the, what happened is there's been a serious, you know, we've had this housing crisis for a while. It's just, it just didn't get invented in, in 2016. And what happened is the Rod Wright, who was a senator, he was a, a senator before, had passed the law in 2000. And in that law, it required every city to write a secondary unit law, right? So they, they wanted to focus the attention on said, okay, cities, you write a secondary un unit law. And they gave, you know, whatever it was, two years to write it, and they all, they all uh, wrote them. And I started off in the Fremont City Camp, uh, Fremont Planning Commission. So like a lot of electeds, you know, Kansan was on the city council, Carmen's on the city council. I started on, the um, uh, Planning Commission in Fremont. And you know, Fremont, much like Milpitas, much like Santa Clara, much like San Jose, much like all the way around the Bay Area, we got single family homes, beautiful stucco, shit, you know, uh, uh, composite roofs, you know, they're worth a million dollars, but they're not that special. 
I mean, we love our homes and we love our neighborhoods, but they're stucco homes. We're ranch style stucco homes. You can go from here to San Diego all the way up to, but, and it's, there's a lot of homes that were built in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s on 5,000, 6,000 square foot lots. So I'm sitting there and I'm saying, I live in a house that was built in 1959, saying, how many secondary units, these ground line units, have been built in Fremont? You know, we passed this law in 2000, I'm, I'm like 2003, something like that. Zero. How about the year before? One. And some guy up on the hill, got a, a billionaire, he didn't care what it was. How about this coming year? How many applications have been in? None. Go to the other cities. How many have been built? None. Get on to city council. We're doing our housing uh, ordinance. I say, give me five years. Five years, how many ADU, or we didn't call them ADUs, we call them secondary mother in secondary units. Uh, how many have been built? Zero, one, zero, one. This type of stuff throughout the state. Now we all know people in our neighborhood who have bootlegged the, the units. They have they built them in the garage, they they converted some part some part of uh, uh, the house, or they just built a little cottage in the backyard because you can do it. It's seamless in the neighborhood. You can't build a single family home home and expect nobody to notice it on a lot. I mean that's crazy. But people have built these units. Los Angeles believes that they have a half a million bootleg units in LA. Now LA, a lot of houses were built in the 40s and 50s, 60s and all that, but they have a detached garage. So what people would do is they'd have attached garages and they just get rid of the garage and convert them into a unit. So you got all these unpermitted units. And my office, my staff is a great staff, but they didn't want me to do this ADU bill. Because I got elected in 2010, so I was in the assembly and I left and finally I came in one year and I said, damn it, I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna introduce a bill to streamline some of the obnoxious barriers that we have. Because cities, when they passed these laws in 2000, they, they made all these barriers and have all these impact fees that they, they, they put in that made it impossible. You're gonna go in and say, all I wanna do is take the window out, put a door and a little kitchenette, and they said, oh, that's gonna cost you 40,000 bucks for the permit to come in. And you, we're not crazy. No, who would pay for that permit? I mean, nobody goes, oh yeah, sure, I'm sorry, well, let me go back and check my checkbook. I gotta get the money. And then they just would do it silently on a weekend and get it done. So we've got a series of bills from 2016 to today that cap with uh, AB, or SB 13 that we hope will allow us to ignite the uh, pent up uh, enthusiasm that folks have. You know, one of the, what, part of the debate that we've been having for four years is local control. People on city council say, we want local control. You, the state, we don't want you telling us what to do. We want local control over our land use. Sort of a historical thing. And our answer, my answer, and still the answer is, we are giving local control to the homeowner. We're leapfrogging over you, city council. We're saying, you who own the house, you have control over your house. With, if, you want to, if you want to slice and dice your house, you can do it. Because a lot of people have a 3,000, 3,500 square foot house. They're there, pops died, mom's there by herself. What is she doing in a 3,500 square foot house? And what you can do is you can, it, we tried to streamline it, that you could go in and build a wall or build, build and convert one of the uh, bedrooms or half a bedroom into the, the kitchen area and build a house within a house, you know, the attached ADU. You can do the garage, but you can also do part of your house. And obviously the, the traditional cottage in the back. So what happened in 2016? When we passed 1069, that was the first ADU bill, we said you can't require parking if you are within a half mile of transit. Not major transit, you don't need a fixed line, you just need a bus. Because you have places like Yuba City, right? They got like one bus line that goes up to Chico or someplace like that, that you say if you're within that half mile of line, you have an absolute right to build an ADU, to convert an ADU. 
Um, and you couldn't, you didn't need to build houses, they didn't need to build parking. Because that will cost you some cities, when we passed 1069, required a free stand. You, you can convert your park, your garage, but you had to build another parking structure, it had to be covered. You know, nobody's gonna spend that money. And nobody's gonna spend that money. They they say, I live by, I take the, the bark's coming to Milpitas soon. Uh, any day now, we're gonna have that announcement. And you, you came in and you said, okay, how can we how can we make that convenient for people to do it? So one of the major things that we did this year, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm delighted to be the author of SB 13, but it, what did Hillary Clinton says? It takes a village. I mean, it doesn't, it didn't happen on its own. There were colleagues in the assembly that I, that I had to work with because it became popular. You know, in, in 2016, nobody was talking about accessory dwelling units. We changed the names because what we did is we said, and we did it this year in SB 13, we said those are developer impact fees. You're charging developer impact fee. I'm just a homeowner. I'm not a developer. I'm, I'm one and done, baby. I'm gonna do one accessory dwelling unit. I'm not gonna do a series of them. I don't, I don't have that. We can, I'll use an architect, I'll use a builder, but I'm gonna do one. So we came up with uh, the concept of not allowing people sudden cut off of 750 feet that you could build if there's no developer impact fee. Now a lot of people say, well, how about the cities? How about the schools? Well, right now, in fact, the schools didn't even know it when I was testifying on the first bill, 1069, the school districts came up and said, no, we want to do the impact. We want to collect the fees, we need to pay for schools. And you said, currently the law says you can't collect any impact fee if it's 500 feet. So most garages, conversions are four to 500 feet. So why are you gonna charge somebody? Now, let's say you got a big garage and it's 520 feet. For the 20 feet, you're gonna charge me $30,000? Are you kidding? You know, I mean, we need uh, closet space. We, you know, it's, it's 500 feet is, is small. Berkeley did a study, Oregon did a study. They say in all the ADUs, 7% may have a child. 93% don't have a child. So we, you know, shared that with the senators and the Senate members saying, point. Berkeley is saying in, is like point, Four percent, you know, it's 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 nothing. It's 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 a or four percent, not point four percent. Four percent of of the ADUs these, these four to five hundred feet because that's really designed for one person. So, so SB thirteen, it takes a big gorilla off everybody's back that says if you're under seven hundred and fifty feet, there's no impact fees. You know, some cities were charging fifty thousand dollars for an impact fee. Were uh, a Cascadero. I mean, who, you've been to Atascadero, it's got a mental, uh, it's a state prison for the mentally insane. You're gonna build an ADU and you're gonna give them $50,000. So so that little, that part is off, and, and that's a big in, 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 inhibitor of having people do it. The other is trying to deal with all these bootleg uh, uh, units. You know, the, the, the working model is that there's 500,000. Some of you people are in the real estate business. You know what would happen, what, would, what the real estate people have been doing for 10, 15, 20 years is sell it as is. You know, if it's all cash deal, it's good, but we just sell it as is. You know, that's the, that's the, uh, the euphemism that you folks say when somebody's got an illegal unit. So this opens up the door to say, no, we're going to take the, 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 this transaction and have a legal, unit that you can sell and you can use. Obviously, I don't have to tell the real estate people that makes it more valuable. And we were very careful to use health and safety. It's not code. It's not, you don't have to bring the unit up to code. It's health and safety. Now, this is part of the education that you have to do with the, with the planning uh, inspectors and the people come out because you go to the website, print out SB 13, yellow highlight, underscore health and safety, because Wykowski was very clear that we're not bringing things up to code. The benefit for cities is that we believe that ADUs by design are affordable. They're, it's, it's 500 square feet, 600 square feet. It's gotta be, afford, it's gotta be affordable. Now, people will, you know, 
we, we live in Silicon Valley, so some guy is gonna get 2,500 bucks for 500 square feet in Sunnydale. Okay, I get it, that's, that's a special, but generally the, it's, it's an affordable unit versus a two bedroom, two bath uh, apartment, which is 2,700 bucks or 3,000, whatever, whatever that is. So the cities have a responsibility and they're getting a lot of pressure to build their, it's called the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, R-H-N-A, it's RENA. You hear that? You got the arena goals, and APAC gives everybody the amount of houses that they have to um, build. And in the bill, we say to the cities, you can take these this amnesty program and count them towards your next arena goal. So the the houses already exist; people are living there. So you say, I got Milpitas. Pick a number: four hundred bootleg units that are there. Oof, magically. They go in and, and somebody says, okay, we want, to, we want the city, we're gonna pay the permit, you gotta pay the permit, right? But there's, it's safe, it was built in 1985. It looks like it was built in 1985, <laughs> still got this. But it was, it was up to code, it just never got a permit. The building inspector says, your health and safety, you're, you're okay, and it becomes a legal unit. And all of a sudden, Bill Peters and Vermont and San Jose get to count these, these units. So that was the other big thing, there's the amnesty, there's the fees. I should have my bill better. Let me think. Huh? Make sure. How am I incentivizing it? Um, oh, owner occupancy. All right. This is another little little bit of barrier that cities would do is they say, oh, if you want to have an ADU and rent it out, you, you have to either live in the ADU or live in. Uh, live in the house. So think about apartment complexes. Do you think the guy who, or the gal who owns the apartment complex that lives in Los Angeles lives in the apartment complex? No. How about a fourplex? How about a duplex? You can have a duplex. You don't have to live in one of the duplexes. It's not, it's ridiculous. And say, why would you do that for an ADU, but you don't do it for that apartment complex there? I mean, all these apartments are building on. Can you imagine that the owner had to live in one of the units? It's nonsensical, but these folks are very determined. So I had, to, I had to take an amendment I didn't want to take, I held on until I got to the assembly, that says that we have, you, you cannot require um, home ownership for five years. Now, I had, if Bob Wykowski had his way, you wouldn't allow it forever. You would just say build it, but I had to take a deal to get the bill off, so, so now, if, during this amnesty program, same thing with the amnesty program, I had to take an amendment that cut the amnesty program off in five years. You know, because people, they, there's a certain element that wants that gotcha, you know, that you didn't come legal in five years, so we gotcha. Now you gotta tear the whole thing down. And we're in a housing crisis. Now I'm trying to make it easier, seamless, educate each and every one of the 495 cities, um, planning departments, and building uh, codes. Now, everybody knows that these, you know, the other change that we made is that, I'm telling stories now. When I did 1069, we said, you should issue a permit within 30 days. Within, or 60 days, 60 days. You have to issue a permit. So, because what we found out is that I come in with my ADU, and it sits there for a year, as they're going, they're going from zoning to planning, to zoning to planning, to back up to the city manager's office, That's, Back to legal, they gotta go over the legal. You're saying, it's a 500 square foot cottage. What are we making, what are we, we doing? And I was in the hearing room in the assembly and they said, we want more time. The county said, we can't do this in 60 days. We can't do it. So I took an amendment that said, okay, it was 120 days. Then we did some research. My office did some research and said, the Accountability Act of 1977 required that all cities make decisions regarding all applications within 60 days because they didn't want people, the city sitting on it. And I said, can I say this? You son of a bitch. I said, you, you guys, they fight so hard to, get, to make it more difficult. So we undid that in SB 13. We undid that to say six, 30, 60 days. Now what, what should be happening? What should be happening in Milpitas, in Fremont, in Sunnyvale, in Cupertino, in San Jose. We've got some architects here, we have people with prefab, we have 
A lot of people were paying attention to California and ADUs. Cities should be able to understand plans that have previously been approved. You know, if you, if you have a plan that is, you know, 620 square feet, and Joe Blow, who lives on Kokomo, got it approved, you should be able to walk in and say, it's the same house, and, and here's my, here's the architectural drawings, here's my fee that for the permit, because you need a permit, but that's done, and I want to approve now. You know, the, the prefab stuff, when these folks can come in and do the foundation, and drop the unit in there in one day. It's it's it, it's magic. You you you're there. I mean, they got to do some site preparation. They do it, but you walk in and all of a sudden, grandma's in the back unit. And when all the, I mean, I'm not here to tell you that I'm the I'm solving the housing crisis in California. It's 80 years. That's not going to solve the whole thing. But it's it's an inexpensive way to provide housing for folks. No, I'm not 12 years old, right? If you look at the history of our state and the history of the United States, 750 square feet used to be a starter home. You know, some of you in your 30s, and it must be some of you, these guys, in your 20s probably, is that 750 square feet is two bedroom, two bath. You know, it's it's a starter home. San Lorenzo, I'll tell you, I'll end here and start with the question. San Lorenzo, up in Alameda County, first homeowners association in the universe. Right outside, right outside of uh, well, San Lorenzo, it's unincorporated Alameda County. The first uh, homeowners association built these houses in 1946, just south of the port when the war was over, and built these two bedroom, one bath, little bitty things. And you go on the, the, the original plans, and you go you go to the houses, and you see a door on one of the bedrooms. That's weird. You know, two bedroom, you got a door, you got a front door, a back door, and you got a door off of a bedroom. And you read in the plans in 1946, promoting families that didn't have children, that just newlyweds in 1946, to offer a room for a service person who was getting a Done, or somebody that was working at the yard, at the shipyard, or at the at the, the naval yard in Alameda, so that you could share the home. They didn't call it ADUs because they objected to it. They say we don't want this, we don't want this, and we look back and say, oh my God, look at what you guys. These houses were designed to have that. So the other thing that just I'll wrap it up and I'll take your questions is that you know cities objected to. They're going to change the character of our of our stucco homes, our, our stucco ranch style homes. And it's good, and, and some of them require that your ADU have the same architectural look, the same stucco, the same crappy wood as your 1983 house. You know, they've not, you know, some around the state, they, they put that in. So if you're gonna build an ADU, don't you wanna, you know, trick it out, man. I want, I want like, Little Red Riding Hood, cottage in the backyard, or something, or something like that. People like slick and all that. So that was another little challenge that we have in the, in the cities to do it. Um, other, there are a couple of other friends in the assembly that that tried to, that are worked on things to streamline uh, the ADU process to make sure that the junior ADUs, which is that has a smaller kitchen area that can be part of the house. You can you can actually go, you can have a junior ADU that you go into the main house and use the bathroom. You know, it's fine. I didn't, I didn't get the bill, but I said, okay, yeah, <laughs> make it happen. And then also allow you to do actually two ADUs on your site. If you do a conversion of your garage, you can do an action, you can do a standalone uh, ADU in the back. So if you, if you want it, you can do two. So, questions. I think I've talked way longer than I should have. But I have. If I don't know the answer, I'll make it up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so that's it. So that's, I mean, all these laws took effect January 1. So you should be able to go into the city. You've got a lot of folks here that. We're in the process of educating the cities. So next Thursday, I think it's Thursday, 
I'm on a panel up in San Francisco with the Bay Area Council talking to folks on how we're gonna send out people like Evelyn and like you, the evangelicals, to talk to the cities about doing it. I'm going to Harvard School of Planning is having me at a, at nationally to talk about ADUs and how these barriers are, and I've got another thing down in LA sometime to talk to the city planners. You know, I, I, I've gone to a couple panels and talked with them and saying, you know, stop trying to send your kids to Stanford on the back of some homeowner here who wants to build a, a unit in the backyard. I mean, it's it's unbelievable how complicated they try to make these things. So you had a question. Yeah, so how many parking spots do you require? Zero. Zero. No parking spots are required. If you're within if you're within a half mile of transit, zero parking spots. You don't have to do anything. And now that cities will complain about they said we got too many people parking. Well, if you're within a half mile of transit, then you don't. Now, the, my goal, if, if the world according to Bob Wykowski, is I would like to have cities say, we're not gonna, we're not gonna have parking requirements anywhere in the city. Because, you know, like San Jose, you may not have, you, you may live farther away, but it's, it's like, you know, my dad's 92, and Mr. Perez is 88, where I grew up, you know. And they sort of stand up in front of their house in case anybody parks in front of their house. They think that they own the street there, you know? So I get the mentality. That's my house, and you can't park here, right? Now, I don't want anybody parking here. Uh, and so, you know, that's there. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not immune to it, but I say, no, really, that's public street, and people can park there. And again, uh, we're trying to make it easier for the homeowners, but we're really trying to create more housing opportunities that are affordable for people. People that will say, you know, uh, you know, my big dream is all these groups. You're here with the Philippine American real estate folks. That people will, you know, the teachers associations, the former firefighters and cops, people who were able to build, buy houses in Milpitas and Fremont and San Jose back when you could afford a house. That would take take this opportunity and build an ADU and rent it to some teacher or some firefighter, whoever, whatever they did for a living, an insurance agent, right? Whatever it is, you, you decide that I want to rent it. And then some of us, you know, my brother's got a friend who's been following this, and he's building an ADU to move into. He's going to move into because it's, he's divorced, so he's got some girlfriend in Indiana, someplace back there. So he's he wants to spend some time there and move, but he still wants to live in his neighborhood. He still wants to live in Santa Barbara and say, so I'm gonna rent out my house. Some of us haven't prepared for retirement, and or some of us, young people want to buy a house. You know, when I did the bill, somebody in, in Oakland was buying a house, they were converting the garage to the ADU, and they were gonna live in the ADU, because they didn't have kids yet, with the idea that they'd rent out the house, and they were that was gonna be able to, to work financially. So we've been talking to the bankers, you know, bankers generally don't love me. Kansen Chu talked about some bills I do that, that holds, hold them accountable, probably do another bill this year. But I'm saying, you guys need to create a product for people that say, you know, I'm on a fixed income, and I, and I want you to count the anticipated revenue that I'm gonna get from the ADU. I'm gonna convert my garage. It cost me $170,000. I'm gonna trick it out nice, and I'm gonna be able to get rent of Fifteen hundred bucks, right? So the, the mortgage that I want to take, I own my house free and clear, but don't just look at my Social Security and my little bit. Count this income, and they have that product that you know. When the banks want to do something, it's snap, crack, and pop. When you want them to do something, it's unbelievably slow. So, next question. Yes. Is, is if you live in an HOA, how do you help those folks? We don't. We don't. That's a, That's the. That's the donut hole here. Is that? Is that we have? I did another bill on democratizing the elections in HOA so that people are now 
maybe have more participation, but all we're doing is encouraging HOAs to do it. Laura Friedman had a bill on this issue, so we, we spotted it. Uh, she's a good friend of the assembly. Um, she, one, she says that, she clarified that if the city will allow it, that you can, you can subdivide your lot to allow for that uh, um, ADU to be on a separate lot. And, It prohibits common interest developments from banning construction of accessory dwelling units or junior units, but allows homeowners associations to impose reasonable restrictions on construction of ADUs. So we, she's going at it at the way we're saying you cannot ban them, but you can do some reasonable restrictions. Because again, some homeowners associations, you don't know the difference. If you drive down there or if you're campaigning for uh, assembly to walk the district. You don't know if this is a homeowner association or not. So that's, that. she did a bill to, what would Spike Lee say? Homeowner associations do the right thing. Do the right thing, but we don't have a hammer because they have covenants and restrictions on the property and more work to be done. Yes. So the question is, is there, there were other, other than what I talked about now, there's other elements that try to liberalize the, or remove some of the barriers um, that you have. So, um, you know, Scott Mayer did a bill on housing development accountability. So there's a Housing Accountability Act, and ADUs are now included in the Housing Accountability Act. So that's, that allows, it makes certain decisions ministerial. If they do, and 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 it, he added positions to help with the enforcement. So if you're getting jammed by a city, you can go to the housing. It's an agency, right? And it extends the protection that you know if you're if the city's stopping you from building a home, it extends that protection to ADU so that you can come in and say, hey, this city is denying this, and it, Mikowski's bill says I should be able I should be able to do it. Um, Bill Ting up in San Francisco did an ADU bill that allows the housing community development to submit proposed standards. I mean, we've got we've got ideas of, of what the ADUs are. One of the challenges that we have is that with Title 24, which is our energy efficiency, and some cities, not to name Berkeley, but name Berkeley, uh, has early on was interpreting Title 24 that basically required the person to build a glass house because they wanted so much light and 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 taking advantage of the uh, you know energy efficiencies that we want to do that you would have I mean there'd be so much sunlight in that house and you, you, you might as well just walk around outside so and Tom Bates who used to be the mayor actually grabbed me at a Cal football game. Because he and his wife, Lonnie Hancock, who was a senator with me, were trying to do it and saying, this is a big problem. These people are off their rocker. He's the mayor, the former mayor. He says, the city's off their rocker about having a Title 24. So this is a way to get at it um, with, so that we would propose standards, which seemingly would relax, relax the energy efficiency so you could build the stuff that you look at, right? You know, I mean, brand new houses are much more energy efficient than the old stuff, right? Um, I talked about Friedman's separate, you could subdivide property. The, the, we, you know, a lot of people are making a lot of noise about Airbnbs, you know, and have restrictions. I, you know, I didn't care. King's bill says that you gotta have a lease for 30 days on death. I mean, I don't care. I, I, I'm, I feel like I'm a real estate person. I want product, you know, I want more product out there. I don't care if you, I mean, who, 
has an Airbnb in Milpitas, right? I mean, you could have had an Airbnb at the football game last week. That would have been a good time to have an Airbnb here. A lot of people coming in saying, I'll rent this for four days, uh, you know, and if the Sharks would win, you could imagine that would be, but, but it's not, people that use Airbnb in Fremont and Hayward and Milpitas are people looking for a job that came here from Idaho and they don't know where to live and they want to stay, the job is here and they say, okay, I'll, I'll Airbnb your house for three months or four months or something like that. So, um, and then Bloom did another bill, he's a partner of mine that, that tightened up the distance and how you calculate the, uh, a half mile from the house because some cities were saying you had to go, you counted on the sidewalk that you would go versus as the crow flies. So they say, oh, you're outside the half mile. It's, you're two steps before you got it. So he did that. I mean, it's, I did a cleanup bill after I did 1069 that I had to define what para, what, um, not parallel parking, tandem parking. Cities came up and said, we don't know what tandem parking is. You didn't define it in your bill. And I'm thinking, tandem parking? I mean, it's in tandem, one half to the other. You could, you could do it. So I had to do a bill to do it. So this is, you know, I mean, people make fun of the legislature, and you're, you're doing all these things, and you realize the some cities were, not, were saying, we're not going to count this as parking you know, on, on, on the lot. Because some people were outside the half distance, and they said, well, I'm just going to park in tandem, and that's going to count. So that's sort of the highlight. Another question. Yes. Is there any lot requirements as far as size? Yeah, no size. Yeah, the that was another thing that cities were doing is they're saying how how big your lot has to be and the floor area ratio. They were doing things where you know you you you're up in Berkeley, you got a six thousand square foot lot, and they have a nine hundred square foot house. One of those old little, you know, shake side, it was great, but they burn up. And they passed a local ordinance that said you could not build an ADU that was more than 50% 50, 50 of the existing house. So if you got a 3,000 square foot house, makes sense. You know, the only requirement we had in 1069 is that they can't be bigger than 1,200 square feet, right? 1,200 square feet, that's, that's bigger than my house was when I was there. That's three bedroom, two bath. <laughs> you know, so so that so you there's no minimum lot size is another another way. It's again, it's a barrier. You had a question. Yeah. So process wise, uh, you said your plan is the same, and that's no way of saying. So if if it's approved, um, how much more involvement does the city want to give them? If it's denied. Example one, this is, if, if, if you're approved, how much more involvement does, would the city have? The answer is a lot of involvement. Just how much can they, they charge? They're, like any other building, they're able to inspect. They're able to make sure that your, your plumbing line and, and everything is, is up to code, that you're doing it correctly. They do the final inspection. They have, they, they have fees that they can charge you to do those services. I mean, that's just this the way it is today. Is that somebody comes up there and the meters run, it's like a lawyer, maybe. It's like they're gonna they're gonna ask you to to uh, do that. So they they until you have your final uh, cutoff, that's why I think a lot of people like, you know, I tried to make it easy so that you could do it yourself. You know, I mean it, if you wanted to build a little cottage or you can you can parse it out, you know, you don't have to get a, a general contractor. You can be the general contractor. I mean, my wife and I did an addition onto our house. We did 440 square feet. We expanded the kitchen. She's got the kitchen that she wanted, so it's happy. We took the la the littlest bedroom and and expanded it and put a bathroom in. So now we have a three bedroom, three bath in, in Fremont. And we went, you know, technically we went from one oven to two ovens because we got one of those. Not a wolf, but the other one. Viking, we had a Viking, you know, so we got two ovens. And it cost us, there was no impact fee. There was no, I mean, I had to get a permit. I had to have to come out at the different times and make sure that things were done, but I didn't have to, you know, I didn't pay anything extra other than 
that. And it was a one day permit because I wasn't more than 50% of my house size. I wasn't going up. And it was, we went in with the plants and they gave me a permit and I walked out. You know, I paid whatever it was. Uh, and that's how, and so, but if I had wanted to put another door in and separate a separate wall back in 2000, when did I do that? 15, 15, like that, it would cost me a fortune. I'd have paid, you know, $47,000 or some crazy thing, which I wouldn't have done. I would have bootlegged it. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have done that. Uh, yes. Last question, I have a wedding. My goddaughter is getting married today, so I have to go to a wedding. So I got to go. You know, I have a lot of okay. The problem with that is uh, you, you have a lot of problems with like, Berkeley, Oakland, and San Francisco. A lot of tenants uh, are supported by the EDC, and they'll go after, actively go after their owner for, you know, miscellaneous uh, uh, little issues, and they suit them for over hundreds of thousands. Uh, I, you could read the news that this is a, actually a, a, a regular event. They have active work, go after work, they have, you know, there's a lot of people pumped them to suit the vendor for that, because they don't think that you could do that if they're pumped them. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, we are Sue happy, so I don't know if, I don't know if, and, you know, a lot, if it's new construction, you know, and it's a, it's a uh, commercial activity, you know, you're going to get the people with, you know, um, disability access, access, they're going to come, they're going to come in versus if I'm a homeowner, I don't have to provide that, I don't have to have wheelchair accessibility, I may want to build under universal design, but, but, I gotta think about that because I haven't heard that that's a problem with the individual homeowner. The commercial guy get it. They get, you know, if I own 30 houses and I'm putting 30 ADUs in, then I can see somebody suing me because it's it's my it's a business. But just the one and done, I haven't heard that. There's a future home. Yeah. All right. Last question, then I'm out. Yes. Which cities in the Bay Area are most actively pushing for ADUs and doing the most assistance with getting ADUs, making well, it more favorable. For right. Us. I mean, I think you have to say San Jose is doing because you know I was saying to somebody, Sam Ricardo's sister Laura went to law school with me. So every time I introduced the bill on ADUs, he would introduce an ordinance in San Jose that did a little bit more than what I did. So they, I know, I said, that's good. I wish every mayor did that. So San Jose has a program that they'll loan you twenty thousand dollars if you to help with all the, you know, all the the little incidentals that, that you have to do to help you um, build it. So they've done a pretty good job. The other cities that in here have done a pretty good job of of what's the, coming to Jesus on the impact fees and nickel and diamond folks. I mean Fremont. Before when I introduced SB 13, they stopped charging impact fees. I saw them. they didn't want to deal with me. I just said let's just skip that. So, so it's it's happening. I mean, that's the law just came effect. What's today? The 24th. So it's only yeah, 24 days. You know, so it's came. They knew it was it was happening. Um, you know, part of the housing community development. And I, two years ago or three years ago, when we passed the first bill, did a, a tour. This deal in San Francisco, they're trying to get that we're going to take these discussions and go into the different areas. Uh, you know, San Diego wants me down there again. I did something there because, you know, Encinitas is, Encinitas is, you know, like the biggest Republican town in the world does everything wrong. And they love ADUs, right? They love they they have figured out that ADUs is going to be the the, um, the answer for them to meet their housing. Uh, and they, I mean, they, the mayor came up to me at one of these things. I don't know who you are, and they say, "We love you, White House. The ADUs, and, and thank you for this, and thank you for that." Um, so those are there's there's many of them. Some of the worst ones, you know. If I can, I don't want to beat up on Santa Barbara, but they're horrible. You know, and they act like, you know, they have, you know, there's some, you know, it's, uh, you know, Oakland is back ass words, but they, you know, because they, they act like this, there's this specialness about their track homes. 
You know, it's in Oakland. He goes, this is a track home. What are you talking about? Built in 1964. Really? Really? I mean, and, and there's, you know, there's a paranoia about gentrification. You know, you're saying, this is a beat up house. You know, I, I, there's so many lots that have space up in front. You know, the, the, some of these advocates will say, look how much space you have from the street to the house. And they have setback requirements because they want to have, they want to, I mean, you drive through suburbia, we're so used to it, right? But it's like all these little pimples of garages. You know, we, we drive by and visually all we see is garages. And the idea of bringing a house up in front of the garage the way it used to be built. But you don't see everybody's garage. You see this portion of the house, or you have a separate ADU that's up in front on your 2,000 square foot open front lawn. I mean, who wants to mow that lawn, right? So this is these are the type of ideas that you want to push the planners, push the cities, push them to say this is this is improves the character. You know, it's still single family track homes. So. Thank you for all your interest. Thank you for the ball. Thank you, Senator Bob. I, you know how I remember Senator Bob's last name? It's with a Y and a cow and steam. Bob Wykowski. Thank you so much. You can convert 25% of the number of units in that five plus six, so one garage, you would be able to convert. And, um, that's how the numbers went up. Thank you. So, talk to Vicky. And I didn't know about the multiple because the ordinance only deals with the two, but the FC13 did more than awesome today. I am. Samana. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anna, for that uh, generous introduction. Um, Welcome everyone, and I hope everybody is not sleeping at this time, right? We're getting hungry, the food is getting ready, okay? And so then, um, so let me, that's all right, so. <laughs> the, the Santa Clara County, uh, basically Senator Wikowski had already covered everything for the ADU, specifically for uh, the regular ADU, what is, what is the restriction? Of course, HOA, there's no restriction for that. There's no requirement for uh, parking space and uh, can be attached, detached, whatever you may call it. You can also convert your garage. And so, for the junior ADU, um, it has to be um, a separate kitchen. You know how it is, right? Separate kitchen, and then um, of course they can share share the bathroom. Okay, so you can have at least one bedroom for the regular ADU. Of course, you should have your own kitchen, your own bathroom, and and stuff, right? And because normally it's uh, it has to be up to code. Now, speaking of up to code, there is, um, as mentioned by a uh, senator, there is what they call amnesty program, which is, um, of course, um, uh, this is this is like for illegal, not illegal alien, but <laughs> illegal ADUs that were constructed prior to the um, the passing of the ADA regulations, you can bring it up to code, okay? As long as, um, uh, you, you know, um, uh, you have the regulations by your city, of course, there's a city specific requirements, and I will, of course, our uh, specialists will touch on that uh, later, um, but I will be touching only on the uh, Santa Clara County, okay? and. It's effective January 1st of this year. Now, the Santa Clara is already updating the laws, okay, for that regulation. And uh, for those of you who would like to apply, you can apply now because it's past January 1st. Now, the completion of the regulations will be in March of this year. 
So you can just imagine there will be more um, uh, updates coming up. Uh, you know, more updates they're going to be doing, um, revising, and hopefully more streamlining of the process. And so um, you have to deal also with the consultant and, and um, also make sure that you will be assessed, as mentioned again by the senator, there will be an assessment as to whether or not your, uh, your lot or your property is eligible for the ADD. All right? But with that said, I don't have to cover everything because uh, basically, again, uh, it's been covered. But for those of you who have further questions, this will be addressed by our specialist here. Thank you so much. Please come on up. I'm going to call you by company. I hope you don't mind. So I have South Bay Engineering Consulting. Please come up, Angela. I have Dickie from Maxwell. Am I saying that right? I love the name. It's so easy. <laughs> I have uh, Helen from Tiny Homes. Oh, all right. Come on up, Helen's friend. <laughs> And then I also have, hold on, I'm sorry. Another one, my computer is locked down. Okay. Well, what, before I go forward with the fourth one, why don't we have you guys introduce yourself? Take a couple of minutes and just an attached garage. You don't have to call it a junior ADU. You can build it as an ADU, and maybe you don't need one in the back. So then um, you're exempt from the owner occupancy ratio, or the uh, owner uh, occupancy requirement. Thank you. Um, with the new laws for 2020, I think it makes it a lot greater to build you know, an ADU. However, there's still a few things that the challenge is. is like, um, I believe here I say the city of Milpitas, is how long yeah, before you will enact this new law? Um, many times it might take a few months or so before you get ready. Another few things on um, a, a lot of cities they have zero setbacks and different things, but those are things that, although it's in law, it's very hard to build zero setbacks. So I think keep in mind that you want to build a detached in you, try to take at least three or four feet setback from your fences. In addition to that, um, the exciting times for us because um, uh, you have you now have the ability to uh, as in the amnesty that they mentioned earlier, you you now have the ability to legalize your uh, pre uh, pre constructed ADU or uh, illegal uh, buildings. So take advantage of that, um, and also uh, on the design portion and engineering part. Um, there is a lot of rush from people wanting to inquire about it, all of these things. So we find ourselves in the middle of this um, uh, thing. So, uh, but so as a precautionary uh, or advanced notification, you need to get your your uh, ADU started. So before you know, before you, you think it's too late. Actually, I just want you to add. Um, they're doing a great job and. Uh, allowing us to put an ADU in our backyard, but uh, as of January 1st, uh, building codes have uh, changed to uh, 20, 2018 requirements to include, we can no longer bring gas into the backyard, so everything is going to have to be electric. Uh, we're going to, they're going to require um, solar panels, which I think is a great thing. Um, they also require a, uh, a plug-in for a future electric vehicle somewhere in the, uh, you know, in the garage or whatnot and that uh, the, the envelope of the structure has to be net zero energy, which we built anyways and always have, but uh, it's, it's a requirement. So if you're going to build as, a, as an owner builder, just be cognizant. Meaning that uh, there are the Title 24, which is what the Senator um, was, was talking about and suggesting, um, the envelope of the structure has to be um, well insulated. There's going to be requirements from R15 wall insulation. Now it's R21. Uh, ceiling insulations are R30. Uh, flooring insulations are R20. So um, they're beefing up the uh, the envelope of the structure. Yes. 
is, yeah, that's all through the Title 24. So if you're trying to do this on your own, um, there are all kinds of other um, sheets that you would have to put together. Cal Green certifications, Title 24, MEPs, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, calcs, uh, structural, even though you're following the um, the California state structural requirements, you still have to, you know, it's still wise to have a structural engineer on staff. Thank you, Ray, that was very good. Uh, for the comment, the one, uh, hold on, uh, for the comment about uh, Lopez getting on board with the USB 13, I'm pretty sure we're gonna be, we're gonna be, the new ordinance will be enhanced to make sure that we follow, and I don't think it's gonna take months, it's gonna be real fast. Can you have a junior, and say, converted garage, and then can you have an ADU on the same property? Uh, did, and does it have to be detached, or can it be attached? So, did everybody get the answer? I'm sorry, I'm going to have to give these people the chance to ask questions. Hi. <coughs> I live in San Jose. I just want to know what the new laws are for two stories and setbacks. San Jose setbacks and two stories. And two stories. Uh, Roy, you want to answer this one? Yeah, I was just reading an email about that. They're actually allowing a, um, a two story structure to only have five foot setbacks. Originally, it was uh, double your setback and uh, a minimum of I think 25% of uh, window space or openings, but now they've changed that. So again, the rear was the the back for the rear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Okay, who else? Anybody else? Is it? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so, the new law is 60 days from your approval. So, up to that point, it could take a year or more over here. So, do you have any suggestions on how to navigate with and work with the city? There's like seven or eight departments that have been there in downtown San Jose. And they keep saying, well, I can't answer that. ADU construction. We're out of the city of San Jose, so I deal with them all day, every day. And it's, um, thank goodness that San Jose is uh, starting to be a little more proactive. You know, if you're lucky, you don't live in Union City or Berkeley. Um, San Jose, or San Park, apparently. San Jose uh, has implemented something called the ADU Ally. It's a Tuesday, every Tuesday, they um, will receive. Full set plans. We have every, all your ducks in a row. You go in on a Tuesday. Uh, they give you a schedule. Um, they give you an appointment, and you sit down with the planner. You take two, three hours or so, and he'll mark up the project. Um, in fact, that was there yesterday, and he will give you a permit on the spot. So you've got all your ducks in a row. But I would suggest strongly that you have uh, the, the, the proper um, professionals. You know. So um, every property is unique and it got its own uh, limitations or um, sometimes um, you need to know, uh, you need to visit the city um, and talk to them because you need to do your homework. Like uh, if there's an easement that you don't know about, uh, it's important. There's an underground easement that you cannot build a structure that's a no-no. 
Um, and sometimes can be you are on a flood zone area. There are some restrictions that you need to be aware of. So you will hold up a lot of your things later on down the road if you don't clear that to the sea. To the sea. And sometimes you are on a hillside, so uh, the, the seismic or the wind is a, 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 an impact or a, a thing to watch, or the foundation needs to be a special, the soil type of soil is not good. Um, so sometimes you're dealing with the HOA, so that limits your ability or desire to put an ADU. So every ADU or property is um, unique, so you, you need to know what you're dealing with, what you have. Add a little bit. San Jose, you're at the hillside of geological zone also. They won't even look at your plans until you get a geological analysis or survey on there. And that will be a different cost on there also. So, again, if you have questions or not, we can help you look at site surveys or analysis of your lot on there also. Yeah, we advise our clients to make sure that you're working with an architect that is familiar with your jurisdiction. And they'll know how to address anything required within that process. And the cities are mandated now to get your plans approved within 60 days. So it sh if you've gotten everything and addressed everything in your plans, even if they have to provide remarks back to you or back to your to your um, uh, engineer, we were we had an issue come up with our plans in the city of San Jose. The planner actually emailed us and said, hey, we need to address this and this. So we were able to get our plans moving again. So I think they're very aware of the time frame that they have to meet. Thank you so much. Here we go. Well, thank you so much, panelists. Good information, guys. They will be at their table uh, after our next panel is set. And since we're going to end this at 1.30, so we're going to bring the rest of our panelists on. If, um, and before I start, let me say thank you to our sponsors that are here. Our sponsors are here, and this is the reason why we're able to have this. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Intero, Juanita, Salor, and Ernesto. And if you don't know, they have baskets, so please come by. Put your name together and they'll draw for a basket. We also want to thank uh, Manila Dental Center and Orthodontics over there. Raise your hand, guys. And of course, our wonderful DJ, <laughs> South System, Jornel, but he also has an IRAA. So please, they have a table in the back there for IRAA. Please come by. And um, the panelists is also our sponsor. Please come up, State Farm or Rick You. Please come on up. We'll have you introduce yourself. We, we also have Patelco Credit Union, Nicole Pool, and her lovely manager over here as well, Alma Toledo. Alright? Um, for realtors, the realtor panels we have, and I think it's very important when you talk about homes and properties. Realtors need to be involved because you need financing, you need insurance. We all work as a team. So our realtor uh, panelists, Dexter Lott, please come on up. I have Frank Hazilia. Check yourself. It's a big investment. Um, the panel was great in describing the uh, information uh, uh, needed to start off first and so forth. But once you have that, once you have the investment, you want to make sure it's protected. You want to make sure there's liability protection, make sure there's property protection. Um, we specialize that here. Uh, come talk to me. Thank you. Uh, I've been in the city for over 18 years and started a uh, forward income, forward value product at Fast Credit Union that I was with and have worked with several ADU specialists, ADU builders, and currently working with Mighty. Mighty buildings and then um, hybrid core homes. I was in the Coffee Park fires and we thought that it was an amazing opportunity to build units there. There wasn't really any action. There's a lot more action here. Um, so I understand the AD regulations. Um, I am currently working with um, borrowers and members to do financing to get the units installed. So um, let me know if you have any questions and thank you for allowing me to be here. Hey, Nicole, all right, we have direct funding. Mark Thailand up here. 
Hi, I'm, I'm Mark Taylor. I write mortgage funding out of Los Gatos. Um, like the senator said, uh, there are actually renovation loans and other options outside of the traditional cash on refinance. Um, renovation loans will allow you to um, finance the project and will also let you use proposed rents to qualify. In addition, uh, help with uh, the reappraisal and so you can meet the loan value requirements. So I'll be here if you have any questions. You're going to be right here because we're going to ask questions. All right, we're going to introduce our wonderful, uh, a couple of people that need to just introduce themselves. They might not all want to be panelists, but these are your relatives. Great question, thanks. Uh, well, basically, Tell Wachowski, you know, made a comment about some of the cities are implementing, you know, basically forgiveness. So if you live in one of those cities that has already implemented the system, which the city of San Jose right now, I think they passed it last Tuesday, that amnesty is going to be in place, but you have to make sure that it is first before you can say, I have, you know, gone to the city, went to the process and all that, permit. But if you don't have permits and you want to sell your home, one of the things that we have always done, you have to disclose it that you build a unit without permits at all. And would people question it? Sure. Since there is no permits, no one knows if it's done correctly or not, if everything's at the ability to go, if it's safe. So what you need to do is have a great inspection plan which I think Anna has one of those questions later on, so I'm going to leave it up for later for the inspection. But that is the key. If it has no permits, you need to make sure that you unit gets inspected and inspected properly for have all the inspections necessary that anyone in this room that's purchased a home in the past knows what inspection needs to do. And again, when we go into that portion, I'll give us some more details on that. This actually goes along with financing because you can sell a house, but if they buy it in cash, they don't care. But when it comes to financing, with any type of uh, non-permit, how does the lender look at it, Nicole? Well, the beauty of a credit union is that we do portfolio loans, so we lend out our own money. Our business model is taking our members' money, lend it back out to people that can pay us back. So what we look at um, from the portfolio side is, does it make sense? Health and safety, you know, um, but from an investor standpoint, like we were selling our loans to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they, they've actually said you need to tear it down or take it down. We've seen a lot of garages that have the kitchens and, you know, that are unpermitted. And, and before we can do a loan, um, you know, your traditional 30 year fixed and sell it on the secondary market, they say you have to remove that. And so I, I, it drives me crazy. It's really sad that that's happening. So, um, it just depends. So it's, you know, you, you want to tell your lender about it. Um, you're going to have an appraisal. The appraiser is going to go out and see it, and they're going to comment on it in the report. And then the lender has to kind of evaluate what's the next step. You could get denied for a loan um, if it's there and not permitted. Um, again, if you if you do have one, it's not permitted, and you think it, you know, call call somebody, call Anna or myself. Um, and again, typically a portfolio lender. Um, is more flexible with that, being able to allow the unit to stay there, um, so that you know, because, well, if they're familiar with it, um, what we see out of anesthesia too is appraisers don't really know how to appraise these properties, especially if they're junior accessory dwelling units or conversions. They'll say garage or unpermitted, or they'll leave it out, but they don't give it value. So we actually have actually found some appraisers, um, one in specific um, Apple appraisal that is, is very um, aware and does a lot of studies on the property. Because sometimes they're not even uh, on the MLS, so they're not. They're not. You just don't know that they exist, so it's hard to find comps. So it's a it's a lot um, to consider when you when you have the units because um, not we were talking about jurisdiction. Not every jurisdiction is even the same in that respect. 